Welcome, everybody. Thank you for getting up so early and uh, joining us here today. Um, so we're going to start with a film screening of the film Shy Radicals and then uh, have a conversation with, uh, with the person or the subject of the film, Hamza Asan. Uh, my conversation partner is not here today, which, um, yeah, I thought that doing a, a talk on shyness, uh, I would get out of the opportunity of being on the stage, and now I'm on the stage by myself. So um, <laughs> I'm sure we're going to make the best of it, and uh, you will see Hamza up here on the screen later. So yeah, without further ado, let's watch the film, and uh, see you soon for the conversation. When I listen to that song, it really makes me feel like I'm part of something larger. Mm. It's just a song that seems so universal, and I have no idea how many teenagers who are like in pain have listened to that song. You don't feel as lonely, you don't feel like an island in your suffering. You're kind of part of something bigger. But I'm a creep. But the fact that we're still singing this song makes me feel like the world's not a better place. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, if we all got together or we performed some sort of movement together, we could yeah. make the world a better place and use that song to connect all of us. And that's something that I really resonate with. That's a goal and a project that I'd really want to be part of. You should join the shy resistance movement then. I love you. I want you to notice when I'm not around. You're so fucking special. I wish I was special, but I'm a creep. I'm a What the hell am I doing here? I don't belong here. I don't belong Is Hamza there? <laughs> um, oh, hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, yeah, just before we dive into the conversation, uh, we don't hear you actually yet. Um, I just wanted to say about the format of the, of the structure, which I didn't do before the film, but that we will talk for about 40 minutes together and then have time for 20 minutes question and answer. So. Yeah, please think of some questions now to ask to Hamza. So, can we hear you? Hello. Uh, hello, Krakow. Hello, Poland. Hello. There's a bit of a delay, I think. I'm not sure. Okay, let. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Um, yeah, so there's so much to unpack in this in this film. Um, it's hard to know where to start, actually. Um, I was wondering maybe if you wanted to to start uh, telling our audience here a bit more about um, the idea of the party and uh, the referendums also that you've done. Um, yeah, which were briefly brought up in the film, but yeah, I'd love to hear a bit more about that. So the the. The book exists as a book, but it also produces art projects around it. Um, it's, I guess it's a bit like my life mission, but 
Uh, within Warsaw uh, in Poland, there was a referendum conducted um, whether you'd like to separate into this state of Asperghistan, in which I made these, um, this sort of federal entity, which has a series of rules which um, and laws which um, supposedly combat uh, extrovert supremacy and provide some sort of homeland and base for uh, uh, introvert struggle and um, and uh, that that was conducted uh, as um, I think last year it was um, it was originally part of the 2019 Ljubljana Biennial. Um, so there was a referendum uh, in Slovenia, which was the first country to separate from Yugoslavia uh, via referendum, and um, we won the referendum there by a landslide of over 70 percent. And the referendum as part of the travelling biennial was conducted again in Warsaw and. Uh, Despite the, the the horrible way elections have been going, uh, we won again by a by a landslide. So um, there is this majority that wants to separate into a more introvert orientated uh, political entity. Um, the the book um, it it exists um, as a book, but um, both it's something which I've imagined since probably uh, being bullied as a teenager or a child for. Uh, forms of quiet or awkwardness um and there are many things within the book which have become real 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 things uh in the real world so one thing you see in the film which was the introvert emergency rescue hotline um we actually made a real re emergency rescue hotline and part of the way in which we developed the dialogue from this for the film they are all real calls from real people uh from the public who uh called into that emergency rescue hotline um so yeah, it has this, I, I mean, people ask me what part of it's real and what part of it's fantasy. Um, and sometimes I don't know myself. Yeah, I was definitely yes. curious about, um, I, sorry, there's I, I, yeah, about how much uh, is fantasy or how much is real, but at the, at the end, I don't think, um, yeah, there's necessarily so much of a distinction. Um, yeah, and, and so what about Asbergistan? What, what are the plans for the future then for Asbergistan? Are you going to do more referendums or...? Um, uh, if, if people want to host more referendums, then that's, that's a future option. Um, I, I always thought... Um, so what's happened is that I used to quite consciously curate or commission or edit. Um, I, I, I identified as a curator and uh, that's not something I... Um, do anymore. So since 2017, when the book come, came out, I'm essentially on a sort of never-ending world tour. Um, and I, I don't even introduce uh, myself as an artist or writer. I'm not introduced as an artist or writer. I say I'm Hamdra Insan, I'm Commander-in-Chief of the Global Introvert uh, Revolutionary Movement, and I'm on a never-ending world tour to um, overthrow extrovert supremacy, and I would not stop until that ideology is overthrown. And here I am in Krakow and Poland at the Allen Sound Festival, um, and, and essentially that has actually been my life for the last four years. Um, and uh, as long as that continues. Um, but anyway, what's been happening through these journeys is that um, a series of works independently uh, were developed by many other artists from Turkey to Belgium to Beijing um, of uh, works inspired by concepts of the book or um, uh, certain the, the 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 tool work of vocabulary in the book. So I think the first work that was made was made by a, a Turkish artist based in Kassel um, called the um, Autistic Turn. It was a artist book on um, feminism and uh, autism and computing. And there've been other things from choreography, radio shows, um, other collectives. There's a collective in Manchester called um, Academics Against Networking. So I thought of like maybe even having some sort of pavilion or biennial within a biennial could you imagine say in Venice Biennale there being an Aspergistan uh, pavilion um, or some way of bringing those things all together which has never been done I mean I, it almost comes autonomously just through people who connect but I, I don't know half the people who um, or the majority of people who who, who do this um, so I guess the future is the sort of global journey and rereadings and rewritings of the book um so i don't know there was a guy in brazil and he'd, he'd written the book into um the fora bolsonaro movement um against the um 
uh, neoliberal authoritarian um, Hoodian, um leader in Brazil and there's people who make podcasts in Mexico and there's people in Beijing who reorientate the, the way they navigate that city or Chinese New Year and uh, I'm, I'm very interested in those um, global rereadings or you know I wrote the book in South London in the corner of a cafe I wrote it uh, on the context of the British domestic war and terror I wrote it um, someone invested in a uh, Bengali Muslim community, but somehow the, the, the dialogues about power and, I don't know, marginalization and alienation resonant with so many people. Um, I mean, even you, Lou, are not someone, I don't know if we belong in the same world or like you, it sort of resonated with you too. Um, and that's something that uh, I'd like, I'd like to be the future of the project. Um, there was also just at a practical level the, the the filmmaker Tom Dream. He he works for Black Dog Films, which is a branch of uh, Ridley Scott's uh, production company in London, and he mainly makes music videos. And uh, he he was very interested, although it's still speculative, in develop it into um, either box sets or um, so that's a very banal thing, or or like continuing the series of 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 the. the um, of what we've just seen and um that's that's a possibility of the future too um so i mean it's very much um open um still um i i still consider the book it's not just it's you know it's my life mission as long as i as long as extrovert supremacy exists as long as there's people who feel alienated and bullied that this thing will keep resisting and keep taking new forms so um it's i mean it's it's not a finished project as long as those forms of um, alienation exist Yeah, you, you already mentioned so many things that I want to pick back up on. Um, and yeah, for sure, one of them is how far reaching the audience is. I guess um, the book is also in its third edition, I believe. Um, fifth, fifth edition. So this, yeah, fifth, really? Fifth edition. Okay. Uh, there's an Italian translation that's been doing very well. Someone in Italy even permanently tattooed the shy power thing to her arm. Um, so it has a bit of a cut following there. There's a Spanish translation that should be coming out. Um, uh, so it's expanded to territories. There's there's a lot of stuff in the Spanish language that I have no idea. That just sort of like podcasts and vlogs and things like that. Um, I I don't know. I, it just seems random that so yeah that as yeah some days from Australia, places I've never been to, uh, Mexico, um, Sharjah, like all these um, different territories, uh, Brazil. I mean, and there's there are areas that even the publisher doesn't have. Um, like basis or contacts with um and yet somehow it's sort of spread into these areas um yeah and so uh, in in the film you mentioned about how there's already like feminist movement and black power movement and workers um movement but i also get the impression by how many people this book has touched all over the world that maybe this is kind of an identity politics that could also unite all of these different kind of other identities. Do you, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, there's certainly a diagonal that, that um, crosses over. There's points in which I don't, I, I've sort of situated myself in a lot of those movements, both within London and, and not like uh, felt at home. Um, so yeah, certainly, but I, I also think it's not an additive movement. It's not like, um, Another thing, like you often get these stickers I saw around Venice saying, I don't know, no ableism, no speciesism, no racism, blah, blah, blah. Because essentially, um, if you're talking about introversion, we're talking about the structure of listening. And I guess the structure of listening is the fundamental structure underneath all politics. So it's the fundamental structure beyond um, all things. And um, having said that, there are movements in the real world which have actually adopted the book. So the, there's, a, there's a movement... Uh, called neurodiversity, which um, is a term coined by um, an Australian sociologist, Judy Singer, in 1998. That is sort of certainly within Britain. I don't know the situation within Poland. Has has certainly um, art institutions have adopted that. So that's people with um, autism and sometimes extending into um, dyspraxia or ADHD, um, not necessarily viewing themselves as um, like a disorder as such, but maybe such a different sensibility or um, a different language or form of communication. So the onus isn't on the individual as something to be corrected, but the way in which 
living environments um, could be uh, altered. And the books, like without my intention, was adopted by it. So a lot of the, so there's, for example, there's a curriculum in Brown University called Neurodiversity, um, Politics, Society, and the book's been adopted as that. Also, quite recently, um, I had to speak at a nurses' uh, union in Canada. So they're asking how to apply it to nursing practice. Um, and uh, I, it, it's become part of the general conversation around neurodiversity within um, like academic and arts institutions. Um, people might know Project Artworks, who are nominated for the Turner Prize this year. Um, they already put in uh, the Literature and Neurodiversity Centre stage. Um, uh, I think they're in Documenta as, as well um, for the next edition. Um, and um, I mean, it's, it's very uneven. So. Uh, within certain parts of the uh, United States and Britain, I know it's certainly been absorbed um, within the Netherlands. I'm not sure uh, where, I, where I've been living, um, although they have this thing called Neurodiversity Inclusive Politician of, of the Year. Um, also within Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, which is something uh, I supported, um, uh, there was a branch called Neurodivergent Labour. So there was sort of trade unionists looking at how policy motions um, so we could get better working environments. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's what I have to. That's amazing. Um, yeah, that was uh, a question I had somewhere here with, um, yeah, the, about this link with neurodivergency and I mean, I don't know, maybe you have, um, some kind of practical advice on, um, you know, for maybe our listeners who also identify as shy or introverted <clears throat> yeah. about like coping with everyday everyday life under extrovert supremacy? There's there's lots of things that are already in place, um, certainly within British institutions. Um, so I think in Tate Modern and Tate Britain, they have a quiet room. So it's just designated for, for quiet. Um, uh, it's also used as a multi-faith room. Um, there were certain environments that I actually found um, quite homely. I, I actually quite like um, sitting in cathedrals in London. Um, there's this, this sort of ambience and the, this, the solemnness. I'd also like, say, certain institutions like I don't know, libraries, which are only have nine to five hours usually, or, or work routine ones, to maybe extend their um, opening hours as, as, a, as a normal thing. It, at the moment, it only really exists for like elite universities where you'd have the 24 hour uh, library. Um, uh, I don't know. There, there was, I don't know, I, I still. Um, I, I, I still feel a sense, sometimes I do feel a sense of um, despair because I, I, even though the, the book has been very successful and um, the film has been circulating widely um, and the grand prize, there's still, I don't know, it, it's like, I still, like, the, for recently I, I was, I had an exhibition in Ljubljana in Slovenia um, and um, I didn't feel at home in my own private view and um, one of the pe people who had come and visited the exhibition was one of my fans. Um, a woman called Tina who was um, on the autistic spectrum she, she found it quite difficult to cope with in in the opening um it was I, and it, the whole thing was orientated for like um <laughs> extrovert normativity like it wasn't um I you know I wanted a solemn place to engage with the um exhibition and um the, the film was also part of the exhibition um but yeah it was yeah something it just made me feel quite awkward <laughs> um yeah, um, I, 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 um, I don't know. There, there should be some place in which to like um, at least register grievances and um, unhomeliness, um, but that forum doesn't exist. I mean, at the moment, the only thing that exists is this neurodiversity movement, and as as part of um, academic discourse and part of trade union movements, that's the only space in which one can gain some sort of leverage or, or recognition. Um, yeah, so there, I mean, it'd be nice if there was somewhere that we could just register um, experiences um, and, and then realize we're not the only one and, and, and ways in which the, the um, environment or um, the societal structure could change um, as a result of all these grievances being registered. Um, but such a forum doesn't exist. <laughs> I wouldn't even mind an actual introvert emergency rescue hotline that wasn't just for the purposes of 
um, art or composition in the film. There's a lot of things within um, speculative fiction that have um, become forms of reality. So uh, William Morris, um, he wrote the book called News for Nowhere, um, one of the early socialist um, English novels, like a lot of the stuff becomes inspiration for Clement Attlee um, in how he builds a welfare state after World War II. There's also other forms of speculative fiction, um, such as um, Sultana Rukeya Begum. She wrote a book, um, she wrote a sci-fi story um, in the early 20th century called Sultana's Dream, which is about men doing the housework, which was a science fiction story. Um, I, I like to think things are, are better, or even if they're not totally balanced. Um, so I don't know, there's just um, imagining um, and uh, yeah, when that becomes forms of reality. Um, Yeah, I guess part of uh, of designing new worlds is beginning to imagine them, right? So I think yeah. I mean your book is a, a building block towards this new future, which will be more inclusive. So um, yeah. yeah, this is incredible. Um, okay. Another point I wanted to raise with you was uh, sorry. No, okay. Um, yeah, there's an amazing line in your book um, which I just pulled out. Uh, what is called commercial radio station will iron out every vocal range and instrument into congenial extrovert blandness. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is something that was touched on a bit in the film with uh, this person in the sharing circle um, saying, you know, have you ever been told to chair up or something? And uh, it's also something that came up in a talk we had yesterday about mental health um, also, which is the topic of toxic positivity. Um, yeah. And yeah, I was wondering if you wanted to like talk a bit about toxic positivity, like uh, about the dangers of it, what it is. I feel very validated and... by the toxic positivity hashtag. I feel it's a very welcome trend. It's a very um, validating trend and, and uh, uh, something that's, yeah, belongs to the same family of um, uh, Shire Radical's um, objectives. Um, I, I'm also glad you did this reference to um, music and sound. Um, my actually entry point into conceptual art is uh, avant-garde music. Um, the, the, the thing that changed my life was when I first heard, um, I think, Terry Fox's Labyrinth scored by 29 Cats, which is just a layer in a cat's purring. And then I listened to uh, Steve Reich uh, in my mid-20s uh, as an undergraduate, um, and then developing that towards systems of rules, like um, John Zorn or Alan Capro. Um, so some of the people in this festival, uh, such as David Toop, who I think is talking today, and his writings about listening are um, central. And then I'm thinking of ab like, uh, yeah, uh, it's, there's something like tox toxic positivity that's about, I, yeah, like um, iron out, ironing out effective ranges. Um, but I don't know, there's, there's certain modes of listening that come with listening to more uh, avant-garde music or like atonal or, or noise or um it's the, the sort of uh, the, the the realm it exists within um and yeah they, they i guess it does all uh, overlap um. yeah there's there's also something um in in the book uh i forget the exact name of the chapter but uh, basically about your sympathies to the sensitive white man um yeah. and i understand you're in part of a facebook group called uh, people of color who are into white indie music um yeah. <laughs> i'd be really yeah. curious to hear you talk a bit about um these musical inspirations like the ones referenced in the film and yeah. your sensitivities to sensitive white men I don't know, there was, there's, you know, decoloniality is a buzzword. Um, I don't know what the state is in Poland. Um, and I don't know, the sort of, um, the, there's, there's elements of it that I just don't, um, I don't know. For example, I recently saw an amazing exhibition of William Blake, um, the English poet, engraver, uh, eccentric, um, and just meeting people who were sort of quite dogmatically aligned to, um, those those aims of decoloniality, just dismissing it immediately as, as as a white man, and and then I guess also the first points of like public discourse around suicide were um, 
around sensitive white I think Kurt Cobain's suicide, which impacted me quite deeply when I was 13 and still remains one of the most sort of speculated um, uh, suicides. Um, and and the, just the, the music I relate to in terms of its effective range. So I grew up in the 1990s, so um, there, there were other, I know, like commercial R&B music, which I, I still regard as one of the worst genres of music. Um, and, and there's there's South Asian equivalents of it. Um, wasn't something I related to. Um, there, there was more the 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 the, 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 the continuous need to be totally upbeat. It was more the um, I know this uh, affect or um, slowing down. I'm a big fan of the band Low. I don't know if people know them. Um, and I don't know. I just, I just forms of relatability and identification. Um, I mean, it's also obviously meant as a provocation as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just I get. I also think of um, forms of identity which are like um, not totally related to say something that can be demographically measured or instrumentalized or as I don't know, cynically called tick box. I mean, so if you take just the figure of awkwardness, say awkwardness becomes our primary form of identification. Like it sort of is outside something that could be totally demographically measured, or I don't know. Um, I don't know. There, there's 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 stuff in the, the the film, and that's about the commonality I have with Tom Dream, who's um, uh, also grew up in the '90s, about the same age as me. Um, and but there's there's all sorts of like ways in which you can orientate music. So I think um, one of the music that touches me deeply is Sevda music from Bosnia. Uh, there's a very sort of melancholic yearning, like, I mean, listen to Type Sevda in YouTube. It's it's one of the you know, most beautiful um, musical genres. Um, and then you have, like, something which comes around the same time, which is uh, Serbian turbo folk music, which is sort of, um, like, I don't know, it's not even to toxic positivity. It's on, the, on, on another level of ultra, ultra, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, ticket type turbo effect, genuine all things sound the same. So I don't know, I find that um I don't and, and also I, I find even if you one starts with um angsty um sensitive white men, one can find their affect range in other regions of the world and other um genres. And often the way in which whole regions of the world are represented or misrepresented is, is again through um extrovert normative um ways. So the whole of Latin America just been represented by, I don't know, uh, carnival or rumba. Whereas there's other forms of um, how how is melancholia expressed or um, depressive affect or um, and it exists. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know, but I, there's just certain places that I just have certain fondness from growing up. Like I really enjoyed sort of secondhand bookstores in Charing Cross Road, um, sort of antiquarian bookstores. Just people keeping these things alive, which don't really have a relationship to like profit or the market or mass audiences. It was, it was always something that that had a lot of, um, I don't know, my heart was always with those things. Yeah, because you also do this DIY culture zine fest, right? Which yeah. is also... Oh, um, yeah, sorry, something yeah. just popped into my head. I, I was very also affected by um, Mark Fisher's uh, suicide. Um, so the editor of my book was very... I think that was one of her best friends. And I actually curated him at Tate Britain um, shortly before he uh, took his own life. Um, and he actually wrote to me just before his wedding. Um, and I, I think of him as, even though he um, died after the, I think um, later than that, um, it's still, I still consider him part of the, the family. And he's, he seems to have a lot of, partly through his writing through music, probably quite known by some of the audience attendees, but also um, is, part of that family as well. But, he, you know, people who belong to privileged demographics, um, Kurt Cobain is a, a millionaire and a um, cishet male or whatever categories, but has still in touch with this sort of abyss of um, self-destruction and self-annihilation. So there's something missing within that language of privilege that it doesn't um, see that and then and, and then many men of that generation such as um chris cornell from soundgarden incredibly successful corporate musician um you know many layers later also took their life so that that affected me a lot too um and there's some some gap in our understanding 
Um, I also love things like one of my favorite English things is the painter Turner, who lived a similar life and just um, that sense of being absorbed in the sort of the, the color field and that range of sensitivity. Sorry, that was a very long footnote to that last question. Uh, no, I was just seeing if there was a sign. No, I think so. We have, I maybe I have time for one more question and then we go to the audience. Um, so yeah, let's talk about mental health. No, I'm kidding. Um, because you talk about this line that, uh, that everybody is saying, let's talk about mental health. And um, what, what do you propose instead? Um, I, I don't know, I, I'm quite cynical of some of the actors uh, doing that. So a lot of sort of governments, um, say the conservative right-wing government, which has done some very um, horrible um, um, economic restructuring, which affects lots of people's mental health. Within Britain, there's a whole class of people who are never held accountable for anything. And for example, um, I don't know, say if we close many public resources down, that has an impact on people's mental health. Um, if we create massive unemployment, that creates impact on people's mental health. Um, and those things aren't um, included in the conversation. I, I don't know, I, I, I guess like there's, there's, there's I, don't, I, I get the sort of medical model um, uh, and, and the sort of other forms of societal, um, uh, I don't know, I, 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 still, I still want people to be able to um, have contexts where they can speak about uh, distress and um, a, a wider range of <laughs> topics than, than sort of small talk or, or toxic positive um, things. So um, I, I just like when when I hear um, like the Theresa May or, or, or a very um, regressive, uh, just the, the range of people saying that and some of them are sort of not held um, accountable um, for that. I mean, I don't know how the situation is in other countries or within um Poland or um but yeah I, I have a, a skepticism and um I just have a different model of like I like to me distress exists it's real and the disabling effect of distress exists and that's real um when we go to like the diagnostic and statistical manual um that's to me a, a form of uh guesswork there's all forms of power um encoded in um how that how that comes about um and I don't know, just my own experience since, since a teenager. Um, so I was, you know, I've been, um, I've had various interactions with um, psychiatry. Uh, I was formally diagnosed bipolar at 18. Um, I'm just, um, I don't, I, there's other ways of reauthoring um, forms of experience which are um, not uh, functional. So um, I don't know, I thought of, so I often talk about my depressive episodes as being like a form of strike. So a strike is neither negative or positive or part of positive thinking, but a strike um, uh, affirms something about dignity and, and your own limits. And um, it's a way of reconceptualizing what, how we can see it, um, just rather than something just to be cured as such. There's something also within, say, neurodiverse language. So thinking about the sense of slowness or different sense of time that one has within a depressive episode that that um, um, opens something else up. Yeah, I mean, I think um, this like psychiatry model has such a punitive um, has such a punitive model and kind of like taking people out of their communities and out of. Uh, out of their support systems is is not really helping anybody to get better. Um, so, I mean, I think the fact that uh, the shy resistance is kind of also creating, in a sense, like more solidarity between shy, introverted, and autistic spectrum people is already probably so helpful um, for so many exactly. people. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned uh, small also, talk I've, also, I've which is something program. that I think is... Sorry? Are you trying to talk? Know. Okay. Maybe. I don't know, so I just, um, I'm a part of this magazine called Asylum, um, which is a radical mental health zine, as I'm on the editorial board, so it's something that I'd like people, maybe in the audience, to contribute, we're on permanent open call, and uh, that's how I continue this um, uh, critical reflection and conversation around this. 
Um, also, zine culture, like mental health zine culture. So I ran this festival called DIY Cultures, um, and like ways of thinking that's just beyond sort of pathology, but maybe ways of care and identification. So mental health zines have also been important to me since my early teens. Yeah, and you um, invited, uh, I understand, some unemployed people to talk at your zine fest, which I thought was an incredible idea. Um, instead of this kind of format of having panels of experts, this is really turning it on its head. Um, yeah. Could you tell us a bit about that briefly? Uh, so uh, DIY Cultures, the festival I run, um, uh, is a, a zine festival that went on for five years, and um, yeah, one of the most popular talks was called unemployment and um, creativity but I think there's levels of insight that people have um, through um, being uh, long-term unemployed or belonging to I, I don't think I think so much of like the festival circuit are just uh, you know celebrities or people have a new book out on a big publisher and uh, there's something and that's the leftist festival circuit too there's so like people who have those um, experiences of um, dropout or failure or um, that 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 has a whole range of insight and um, things that um, need to be communicated um, and and that's just how one of the ways in which I curated the the dialogues around the zine festival a lot of that archive is still online if one goes to DIY cultures on uh, YouTube or DIY cultures tumblr I think um, and uh, so there were that so I didn't take zines as meaning these cheap um, that copied publications or uh, but also small circulation publications but also zines as sort of attitude aesthetic politics a form of organization a form of rethinker in hierarchy of what is authoritative knowledge or official knowledge or, or mainstream and and that's the way in which um uh, i uh, functioned as a curator as well and i guess a activist within within a blurry relationship between those roles Yeah, I love also like the kind of, um, I guess, anti-capitalist thread that comes along with um, zine culture, which um, yeah. I guess I read something from you about, because I hadn't really thought about this uh, correlation before, but that people are buying zines now more than, uh, maybe more than ever, and um, exchanging with each other face to face, and um, yeah, this is super exciting potential. <laughs> Yeah, there's been a revival of zine culture in the last um, 10 years, which I never predicted. So I've been making zines for 27 years, um, since the, the early 90s and the heyday of uh, Riot Grrrl and you know, Charles Bukowski, Black Sparrow Press and uh, the photocopier and life before the internet. And uh, yeah, I guess there's some sort of digital fatigue. Um, so do you know, I mean, the Shy Radicals book, it's actually, the, the design of it is a reference to Xerox and like early um photocopier toner um but it's also circulates within that realm so i represent show radicals as a zine table and then i have a family of um related publications say there's a lot of autism zines um who who circulate so i function as a distribution or distribution mechanism um and some of the other collectives so academics against networking um which is literally a group of academics against networking in manchester university they circulate their publication through me um, and um, the whole family of um, zines related to Islamophobia, decoloniality. So um, Sarah Radical isn't just a book, it's also this sort of um, dis distribution mechanism. I'm not sure what the zine scene's like in Poland. I look forward to engaging with it one day. And actually, this is the second visit that's actually been um, cancelled due to sort of um, COVID related re reasons. Um, so, but. Um, there's also been a lot of zine culture within um, quarantine as well. So one of the events I'm doing at um, a place called Page Not Found in The Hague, I'm creating a zine for Sol Sol Solidarity, is um, an event looking at zines made under quarantine. So there's a zine called Quarantine, uh, made by Mark Fisher in uh, Chicago as part of Temporary Services. I was also part of a zine called Quarantine, uh, which if you go to my Instagram or at Shy Radicals, that, uh, that it's within the... Um, link in bio um, called Quarantine, and that was made by a collective called Mad COVID, who were a group of um, ex-psychiatric patients. But there were forms of insight, wisdom that came from being in um, 
um, psychiatric custody that that was helpful for what people generally coping with uh, quarantine um, and um, I, I made a contribution to that which you can have a have a look at too. That was actually the last zine I, I, I made. Um, but zine fairs, hopefully, I'm, I'm going to be in Rotterdam zine camp, um, which is next month, which is one of the best zine fairs. Um, so I hope zine fairs in, I mean, I, I like that form of like, yeah, relating to people um, in, in this sort of very, you know, you're creating your own small community um, within, within zine fairs. Um, it's certainly a lot more um, warm and friendly than how horrible uh, online spaces can be sometimes. Yeah, and um, I guess we'll have to ask you to share some of these links because you've given a lot of amazing references throughout the talk today. Yep. So maybe we can put them in the YouTube comments or something like that. Um, I'm just aware of the time a little bit. Does anybody have questions in the audience? Or um, I don't know if anyone's tracking the online conversation, if there's any guests at home sending in questions. We have... Yeah, about 15 minutes, I think. Did someone have a, you have a question here? Is there a mic for the audience? I think someone in the front had a question. My view from my room is I'm looking at an empty sofa. Do you see the room there, Hamza? No, just an empty sofa. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, now I'm nervous. <laughs> um, yesterday we had um, a talk about care, and um, I, ha I haven't read the book yet, um, uh, but we were talking about um, um, how we can support others, and in the movie, in the movie that we watched before the interview, um, there was a talk about, um, a line about uh, what it means to listen. And <clears throat> I'm very curious to know, uh, hopefully I can, I'm trying to figure out the question now in my head um, correctly. Um, I'm wondering uh, with the internet and toxic, speaking on toxic positivity and neoliberal identitarianism, um, when we're truly attentive and we're truly listening um, all in that moment, we are, I believe you can free yourself a little bit from uh, the me that's inside. And I'm um, speaking as a parent for, of a neurodivergent child and I often hear this everything is so loud <laughs> and so I'm really curious to know what your thoughts are on um, yeah the sort of um, ability to liberate ourselves from the um, identity politics that are thrust at us um, and uh, I, I have this thing that I say, like, uh, we should liberate all identities from identity. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this is, um, yeah, something relatable to that. Oh, you articulate yourself very well. Um, and um, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm still reflecting on, on that. I listened to it. Um, um, yeah, I, I, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still absorbing what, what you just said. Um, so, so I, I don't have I don't have a straightforward answer to to, to that. Um, but I, I I thought it was a great contribution. Um, I think it's just like time as well. Um, I, I don't I don't have an <laughs> yeah I don't have an immediate um, thing to um, add. Um, one of the, the activities I liked doing um, in London was um, going to Quaker houses. It was often the, the, the one form of spiritual practice I engaged with. I don't know if they have much resonance, but in, in London, essentially, uh, they just um, sit in silence together for like two hours. And um, this isn't directly answering your question, but... Um, and the film actually, the film is shot in a um, 
a lot of it is shot within a Quaker house, the indoor scenes are, and the scenes with Arlo Parks. Um, and the atmosphere is not in, in a way that's sort of sort of bare and um, quite humble. Um, yeah, um, that's that's a very profound line. We can liberate us, our identi all identities um, beyond identity. Um, there's that's I, I'm still reflecting on it. <laughs> um, there's there's a sense in which, like, I guess people carve borders and territory around themselves or. I certainly don't want people to become cliques. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. It's, it's such a um, profound statement. I have to reflect on it for days and um, get back to you. <laughs> but really thanks for that contribution. It's actually a real good, like, um, thing to ponder on as we go away. And um, I, I, also, I often think, you know, because... Um, me and Lou, uh, we met prior to this and we thought of the alternative formats rather than straightforward question answer and we thought of even dwelling in like a tree house or going to the caves, the salt caves in crack or, or um, other ways of dwelling because it's always impossible to give a sound but bite answer to things all the time or um, I'll ponder on what you said for days though and then I'll do another prep talk and then my pondering will bring some fruit or um, become like something that I, um, there's something to dwell in that question. So thanks for it. There's no pressure. I guess um, something that I that I love to, to think about and inspired by you is also getting more comfortable with silence and um, not having the answers. I mean, I think um, you talk so honestly and from the heart that I, I don't imagine there's any um, <laughs> issue with not having a direct answer to a question. Um, I find a lot on behalf of, of our audience speak. member here. Like, um, um, are there any other audience questions? Or comments, contributions, or? Hello? That's the first um, time you're showing Thank you, Amjad. I was just Hi. wondering if, um, you noticed a link between the use of language and emotional intelligence throughout your work. So yeah. you spoke about loudness and law and policy. I was just wondering if, um, yeah, if there's a relation in hostility in the use of language at all to emotional intelligence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, language is something I'm still, uh, thinking through i mean the a lot of the, the 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 terminology in the book is also just made up the neologisms are in the whole book um and, and that was important in way in identifying or, or like um like navigating places i know like, like I, i've heard that the term harassment uh was sort of um introduced in the 70s and then it provides a form of identification in terms of how one um identifies um, oppression or, or is receptive to that um, and so I think providing these vocabularies um, can create forms of intelligence or receptivity or recognition for um, so I mean you've got the term extrovert supremacist now so how would you identify that or um, within your own spaces um, and just I don't know you know, like, I get, yeah, just put in the, the, I don't know, certain things more central. Um, so, yeah, thinking about loudness and louder people. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't know, like, I still have to ponder on the term emotional intelligence. Um, it's probably a good thing. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if it's, I remember it circulating a lot in the 90s when I grew up. Um, uh, it's it's something I still I'm thinking through as as it's. I mean, it's obviously in in um, uh, in conversation with other forms like I don't know, IQ and other forms of technocratic ways of thinking. Um, but like I, I also will I don't know I I feel like I need time to ponder and think through that term too. Um, I guess people find it useful though. Yeah, there's, there, there, the book, 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just wait for the echo to turn off. Um, like somebody mentioned in the film. Can someone? So, oh, yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hearing myself twice is a bit, a bit much. Um, yeah, someone mentioned in the, the film, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Um, ah, that your that your book is very funny, but you're deadly serious. And yeah, I definitely urge anyone to read the book because it is very funny. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this uh, the neologisms that you come up with, your playfulness around language, um, it's very inviting actually. And I think it's um, it also makes the book more accessible in a way. Uh, and I like this also, yeah, level of um, accessibility because many other books on identity politics can get a bit um, academic and therefore exclusive. So mm -hmm. this is something that's really playful and fun. Um, yeah. Yeah, do we I have any more audience questions? We have one in the front here. So I've just received a thing on saying recording has stopped. Um, um, on meeting yeah, chat. thank you very much. Okay, I had the feeling that uh, you were talking. Um, thank you very much for um, what you shared with us. Um, you mentioned today uh, the, the digital fatigue. Um, I have also to, to say that during this pandemic, like being home alone, um, gave me a lot of time to process um, some anxiety, angers and stuff way better than when I'm in the outside world, quote unquote. Uh, but I also feel this uh, online fatigue and this need of going back to the community and, and meeting again in person. My question then is, what is your take on that and how do you prepare yourself to make this balance maybe? And also, was this time of pandemic a good time also for you because we were kind of forced to be a bit more at home when people had the privilege to be home? Like, how did you manage all these times and emotion and how do you see yourself for the upcoming weeks or months? Um, the, the first the first lockdown was revolutionary. I, I, I love I actually love the first lockdown the first um, I mean lots of um, so the, the, there was a whole new wave of writing around the book around the, the, the advent of COVID. Um, so there's a great article in Freeze magazine, which you can Google saying um, how COVID has a, made us reimagine the arts and it centrally puts share radicals uh, at the heart of that. Um, I think it revolutionized a lot of the ways in which you talk about, you know, like even the term essential worker or, um, you know, things like um, assertiveness skills. There was a whole meme culture around um, introverts saving the world around around that time too and and the environment became better in terms of i know when i was in slovenia there's this beautiful bird chorus you hear um in the more um foresty parts of the city and then when lockdown happened you could hear those bird choruses again in london um and then um yeah so i, I like that first I, I felt like we were better equipped i i mean it shut down my life in lots of ways so i was supposed to tour italy because they're italian translation had just come out but then Italy was the uh, hub of um, like the the pandemic at the time so that never happened but then a lot of I got a lot of fan mail from Italy um, during that period saying the book helped them cope and redefine and it like, a lot of the review the whole new bunch of writing from our Asia Pacific um, other, other places um, that identified it as, as essential lockdown reading I was invited to take modern during the period when it was shut down, they had a sort of lockdown edition of the Late at Tate, which is a um, monthly evening event they did. Um, again, talking about um, my relationship to a pandemic, staying in. Um, and I, I recommend getting that as in quarantine, um, which you'll find in my link in bio in the, if you go at Shy Radicals on Instagram. Uh, in fact, we even did a, um, for the Ljubljana exhibition, we actually made a um, Shy, Rad Shy Power um, face mask for as well as, as, as part of it. Um, I, I do also experience digital fatigue as well. Like I hate um, the times when you're expected to have eight Zoom app meetings in a row. Um, a lot of the communication in Documenta, which I've, um, I'm going to be in next year, is again, like very, very long Zoom meetings with 100 people. Um, and it, it can be quite, um, there's this term Zoom B, like a pun of zombie, like just staring at a screen, which I'm doing now. Um, on the other hand, it, it also redefined it, um, 
the internationalism um, of of uh, a lot of institutions. Um, uh, the institution Innova in in London, the Stuart Hall Library, was quite important to me. And and there, when they went online, actually, like the the dialogue became more international and interesting. Um, but yeah, it's not healthy to just stare at a laptop for eight hours in a row. I mean, I, I'm I'm looking forward to I'm going to be in Rotterdam Zine Camp, um, and I'm looking forward to the Zine fairs actually becoming. Uh, physical and real again too that's um one of the things but i i liked um the, i like the first um lockdown for the you know sense of slowness um gave me time to uh, read uh, tidy my room and um re-archive things and um it, it was a very valuable period I, I found a lot of my friends um involved in office professionalism reconnected with sides of their creativity um um, but I don't know, the way we thought of the value of things changed a lot too. Um, so yeah, a, a, a double-edged sword, but um, I, yeah, certainly staring at a Zoom for too long. Oh, on the other hand, I did a very nice Zoom birthday, um, which could involve all my friends from around the world. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to live in this, like, this situation forever. Um, I wish I could be with you in in the audience. Like I would feel a different energy and connection, and um, like um, yeah. But so I, I mean, I, I don't want. I, I I I mean, I do want the pandemic to end. So, um, but I don't know what what learning or long term um, things we got from this period. Um, but it's certainly something. Um, but we also saw that extrovert supremacy killed as well because people were doing all sorts of dangerous forms of hyperinfectious behaviour because they just couldn't, they didn't know any other way of being. So there's a sense in which we could teach people uh, as introverts. Um, maybe people should learn contemplation or staying in skills or value in um, indoorness or in the same way we were forced to do assertiveness skills as forms of employability or um, outgoing people seen as more employable and so forth. Okay, and I think uh, I think we should probably wrap up, but I wanted to ask you, um, is there a shy resistance way of showing appreciation that's not uh, the loud mm -hmm. clapping? No, it's just this shy power salute, that's what you say. That's black. No, that's maybe you, maybe you can turn the camera to, to show Hamza the, <laughs> the audience and we can do a shy resistance. Okay, good. Yeah. So that's that. So do take that into your own community. This is a hashtag shy power, but this is the salute. Shy power. Thank you so much for you. for joining us online today. And um, yeah, thank you for everybody in the room. I don't know if you got to see, but there is a really a lot of people for so early in the day. So oh, yeah. um, do stay obviously it speaks volumes to, to your work. On on Instagram and Twitter. At Sorry, can you repeat at, again? At, at Shy Radicals on Instagram and Twitter, and I'm very happy to connect with people. I'd really like to, um, you know, I've exhibited in Poland and now I'm part of this festival. I'd really like the Intrafada, which is the Shy Radicals revolt, to continue. And uh, so we liberate Poland from extra supremacy. Absolutely. And let's put all those um, links and everything in the YouTube so people can come and access them. Um, if, so if you didn't hear the Instagram ads and everything, we'll make sure that they're accessible somewhere so people can follow Hamza and read um, the Shy Radicals book, which I highly recommend. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you.